Good morning. Uh, it's awesome to be here today. Um, kind of already introduced myself up there, so I don't need to get into that. But uh, if you did miss it, my name is Stephanie Johnston. I work for an organization called Barnabas Fund, and it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I love that this is part one of the story of Jesus. And to be quite honest, this is hands down um, probably one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Um, I think the story, I'm going to talk about Mary today, and I think the story of Mary is just such a story that is just, um, she's just a legend. I mean, to put it in simple terms, she's a legend, right? And it's not just the fact that God chose her that she's a legend. What I want to talk about today is her response and what that looked like, and talk about how, um, you know, what that might have been for, for somebody back then, and the things that she was going to have to go through, you know? Um, so I want to start, uh, I want to start by reading this again, because I know we've been inundated with, inundated with it so far, but man, you can't, you can't read this story enough, eh? Um, so we're starting in Luke chapter 1, and it's the birth of Jesus foretold, and it says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and he will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I'm a virgin, the angel replied. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the most high will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has now become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but now she's in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. And Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And the angel left her. I mean, I, if I had a mic, I could just drop it right there and walk off the stage, right? Because the story in itself is a story that is so full of power, so full of, of challenge, so full of, of the best yes ever. By Mary, you know? Um, I, does anybody in here like the, sh the show Ninja Warrior? Has anybody ever watched it? Um, they do this one in America called the American Ninja Warrior, and now Australia has picked it up and they do the Australian Ninja Warrior. And, mate, it is just, if you haven't seen it, you need to like YouTube it, Google it, whatever, and watch it, because it's these, these people who are just normal, ordinary people and they decide to do this obstacle course. And they run this obstacle course to the best of their ability, and they, they get to the end, and at the end, there's this warped wall that's about nine feet tall. So it's all upper body strength. You know, they're trying to, like, get across things just by using their, their muscles and their sheer will and de determination, right? And you've got this warped wall at the end, and so many people get so close, and they just can't get up that wall. They've got three chances to get up that wall. And, you know, you just, the, the, the thrill and the excitement when somebody finally gets up that wall. And I remember watching the American Ninja Warrior one, and there was one girl named Lacey Caranzaro. And she, she's probably like 5'3", so about my height. She just completely demolished this, this obstacle course. And she was the first woman in, in history to ever get through and actually make, make it up the warped wall. Now... I love, love, love stories of heroes, right? And I think a lot of us who today, you know, we, we see all of these stories of heroes and there's something about a story of a hero that just inspires you, it challenges you, it just, it gets you going, you know? And this is the kind of story that, that Mary is for me. The story of how this angel came to Mary one day and showed up. Now, let, let's just take a step back here and think about this. Has anybody in here ever seen an angel? I mean, has an angel come and actually had a conversation with you? If I was Mary, I would have been 
terrified, right? So sometimes I think the only time that we hear about this story is around Christmas time, unless you're Catholic and then you probably hear it all the time. But it, being that most of you are here today, I'm assuming that you're not Catholic. So for us, we hear about the story, you know, this time of year. It's always around Christmas time because that's when kind of Mary enters the scene, right? And this story for me is, is just an inspiring story because that day an angel came to Mary and he just, he completely rocks her world. He, he changed her life, you know? And what Mary did that day was she said, yes. And this wasn't an easy yes. You know, we've read the story a couple times this morning. What, what Gabriel said to her that day wasn't some easy, like, pithy little thing that she was going to actually have to do. She was going to give birth to the Son of God. She was going to give birth to the guy who would change history forever. You know, everything in history up to this point pointed to this child who was going to be born. The one that she actually would be the mom to. Okay, first of all, can you be, imagine being mom to Jesus and what that would look like? Like, not just, I mean, the son of God, you know, miracles. We don't know what happened when Jesus was little. We have a couple stories. We have the story about when they go um, into the city and, and Jesus decides to hang around in his father's house and then they lose him. You know, are you a parent? Have you ever lost a kid? It's pretty terrifying, eh? I remember being little and we would go to these, now back in the day, in, in my day, we, we would go to these department stores and I don't know if they still do this or not. I haven't, I haven't heard it in any place that I've been at. But parents back in the day then, they didn't really like, you could kind of run around. So I remember being about four years old and getting separated from my mom. And I remember how, how terrified I was. And then, you know, I'm crying and, you know, the, one of the sales clerks come up and they take me to the front of the store and they get on the, the microphone and they're like, um, excuse me, if you have a little girl with brown hair wearing a purple top, could you please come to the front? Now, most parents at that point, um, you think that they would be terrified, but my mom was just like, oh, good Lord, she's gone again, you know? So she like totters up to the front. She's like, all right, let's go. And I'm just bawling, you know, I'm crying my eyes out. But this story where Jesus kind of gets lost from his mom and dad, Jesus is completely chilled out. You know, he has no fear. He's just like, yeah, I was just hanging out in my father's house. It's all good. I don't know what you're so worried about. And Mary and Joseph were probably just flipping out at that point, you know? So being the son of Jesus had to have been a bit of a challenge. I'm sure there was parts of it that were so joyful and awesome. But Mary knew when she said yes, she was saying yes to something different. She was saying yes to a life that was gonna change for her forever. Can you imagine her thoughts as, as Gabriel said to her what was gonna happen? Back in that day, for a woman to be pregnant out of wedlock meant that you could be stoned to death. You know? To her, she was about to get married to Joseph. So the thoughts that might have ran through her mind was, what, what are my family gonna think of this? What's Joseph gonna do? Is he gonna, is he gonna cut bait and go? Like, is he gonna leave? Like, is he still gonna marry me? What does this look like for me now? And in the midst of all that, in the midst of knowing what she was saying yes to, or maybe not even knowing what she was saying yes to, but the fact was she said yes. And it was a difficult yes. It was a, a yes that meant rejection. It was a yes that meant loneliness. It was a yes that meant that she would look different, that people would look at her differently, that people might make fun of her. You know, as Christians, we are called to say yes to some things that might be hard for us. I talked about early, how, earlier how Christians that struggle in countries where they're persecuted, they're, they have to say yes to difficult. And Mary that day when Gabriel showed up to her, she said a yes that meant, that took guts. It took absolute sheer guts to say that yes. And following after God will often lead us to having to, having to abandon life as we know it or think it should be. It can even be rejecting and hard. When I signed up to be a Christian, I knew that I didn't sign up to a life that was gonna be easy. I knew that when I said yes to Jesus, that 
it was going to be a bit of a difficult road. It was going to lead me to the ends of the earth, to a place called New Zealand. You know, I, when I moved here, I moved here, and I said yes to this job without knowing what to expect at all. And I left my family, and I left my friends, and I left everything comfortable because I wanted to say yes to working with an organization like Barnabas Fund. And I can tell you, it wasn't an easy road. I mean, New Zealand is beautiful. It's stunning, right? You guys are so lucky. You look out at a day like today, and it is just like the heavens have opened up, and there's angels singing, you know? It's a land flowing with milk and honey. I tell people all the time that it's every time I take a picture, it's like taking a National Geographic photo, you know? But man, that first year for me was so hard. You wanna know the hardest thing about it was the language barrier. <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. I got here and I was thinking, this is gonna be easy peasy. Everybody speaks English. You do, you speak great English, but you do not speak American. <laughs> you don't. I needed a translator. I would call one of my Kiwi friends and be like, somebody just said this, pull up your bootstraps. What? What does that mean? I remember going through the McDonald's drive through Right, you guys, you judged me just then, didn't you? Yeah, I saw you, I saw you. I was, I was speaking at a church down in Christchurch, I think, and I go through the McDonald's drive through This is probably one of the, you know, first times I had gone through the drive through McDonald's. First of all, driving on the other side of the road, let's just talk about that. Your drive throughs are in the wrong place, okay? So after I got through that obstacle, I get to the, the um, you know, the little box thing, and I place my order, cheeseburger, fry, Coke, you know, get me through. And I remember the lady saying, wow, that's a lot. And I was like, no, it's not. That's not a lot. I ordered a cheeseburger. It's not a Big Mac. I didn't supersize it. It's a cheeseburger. I'm like, it's not a lot. And she's like, is that the lot? And I said, it's not a lot. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm arguing with her in the drive-thru, right? And finally, she says to me, ma'am, are you done with your order? <laughs> and I was like, oh, because she said, is that the lot? Meaning, is that all you wanted? New phrase for me, but I was angry. I got up to her and I gave her my money, ate my food, you know? And it's, it was this language bar barrier. It was hard, you know? And, and I think, and that's just a small yes that I said, but it was a yes that changed my life forever. I remember my parents, my grandma growing up, um, she, she would always say to me that I was her gift from God, you know? Like she, she had this massive role in my life. She, she took care of me for, for probably since I, was from, since I was born. And she's been this amazing person. And she would always tell me the story of how she heard God actually say to her that I have given Stephanie to you. And so from that day forward, she called me her gift from God. And then when I told her I was moving to New Zealand, she, she looked at me and she said, I know that you're my gift from God, but I'm kind of mad at God because he's taking you back, you know? And so leaving family and friends, that was tricky, you know? Having um, Christmas and summer, weird, <laughs> it's weird. I went to the Santa Parade the other day in Mongray Bridge and we were in shorts and t-shirts. Poor Santa's dressed in his full on like suit. I don't know how he got through, but it's just these, these different things. But I knew and I've known all of my life that God wanted me to say yes to things like this because I know that it's so much more important for me to say yes to something that's gonna be difficult and hard and be in the will of God. It's so much better to be in that place that even though we're moved out of our comfort zone, even though things are illogical, they don't make sense, we're still called to say yes. And you know, Mary, she had this encounter with Simeon, a prophet, um, when Jesus was a baby. And he look, I'll read it to you, because it's just so good, eh? Simeon, basically, it's, this is in chapter two, and, I, and you guys might talk about this, but I wanna just real quickly touch on this part. It says, Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, this child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall, but he will be a joy to many others. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be, be revealed, 
and a sword will pierce your very soul. The fact that Mary had this prophecy from Simeon was a prophecy of a little bit about, a little insight into how Jesus was gonna die. When Mary said yes, she said yes to heartbreak as well. She said yes to having to lose a child before she was going to pass on. And that is hard to have somebody say that, something like that to you. But she's still, in the midst of all those things, she still says yes. And here's the great part. When Gabriel comes to, to Mary, he basically drops a bomb on her. And he, and, he, and he says to her, this is exactly what's gonna happen. This is the child that you're gonna have. He's gonna be the son of God. People, their lives are gonna be changed. And after this, like after he says all this, Mary's response is pretty appropriate. What does she say? She says, but how? How? Do you, yo, you know, Gabriel, I don't know if you know this, but you know, I'm not married yet. And this could be a little bit, a little bit tricky, you know? <laughs> Think about that. Think about the, the ridiculousness of that. And so her response is a great response. She says, but how? I'm a virgin. I don't know how this is gonna happen. Now, I know last week you talked about Zachariah and his response. And here's the difference between those two responses. Because Mary's response, you know, when God says something or does something in our life that is ridiculous, you know, we serve a God who sometimes does things that are illogical. It goes against what we think is, is right. We can't mathematically do an equation to solve some of the things that God has put in front of us. Sometimes we have to deal with loss of a loved one. Sometimes we have to deal with all of these things. And we're challenged at that very point to ask the question, but how? And there is nothing wrong with asking that question. When we say to God, how, how's this gonna happen? Because you know these things, they're not measuring up to what you've just told me you want to do. And Mary says to, to Gabriel, but how? Because I'm a virgin, so this is gonna be a bit hard. You see, the difference between Zechariah and the difference between Mary's response is that Mary said it with unwavering trust. Whereas Zechariah, when he asked, he's like, I'm gonna need a sign or something because what you're speaking right now, Gabriel, is just crazy talk. You know, he didn't believe that it was gonna happen. And fair enough, I mean, his wife was old as, you know? So fair enough that he was thinking, this is crazy. And then we know what happened to Zechariah. He wasn't able to speak, you know? God still fulfilled the promise to him. He still fulfilled that. But we have to make sure that our response when God comes to us and asks us to do something for him, that that response, we can ask, but how? We can ask those questions but we need to be able to make sure that we ask the same way that Mary asked, with unwavering trust, you know? And maybe it was because she was younger, I don't know. Maybe she just was like, okay, this is God, so it's gotta happen. But the point is, is that she had unwavering trust. And then angel, the angel says to her, nothing is impossible with God. Do we believe that? Do we believe that nothing is impossible with God? Does our prayer lives reflect that nothing is impossible with God? When was the last time you prayed a ridiculous prayer and asked God to do something that was gonna just rock your world? When was the last time that our prayers reflected the thing that Gabriel said? When he says nothing is impossible with God, you see, he gives this example to Mary, he's like, look, your, your cousin Elizabeth, she's pregnant right now as well, and she's old, you know? Nothing's impossible with God. And Mary got that, she understood that. Here's what um, she says, after he says all of that. She says this, I am the Lord's servant, may everything you said come true. Basically what Mary said at that point was bring it on, you know? And we're being challenged today for whatever thing is going on in our life, to say to God, bring it on, and to have that unwavering trust, you know? To live lives that reflect the phrase, nothing is impossible with God. I think sometimes we live lives too comfortably. We got it too easy here. 
You know what's challenging for me? Stories like this about Mary, stories that I hear about Christians and countries where they struggle, where they've cho chosen to say yes. And Mary had this unwavering trust. And here's what Brennan Manning says. I don't know if you've ever read Brennan Manning, but he's amazing. He has this book called Ruthless Trust, and it will change your life, I guarantee it. I read, I read the Bible, that changes my life absolutely hands down, but then there's books that I read that, that do the same. And I remember spending probably three weeks in one chapter, not because I couldn't read, but because it was so challenging to me, I had to keep reading over and over again. And he talks about unwavering trust and he says this, unwavering trust is a rare and precious thing because it often demands a degree of, board, of courage that borders heroic. When the shadow of Jesus Cross, falls across the lives in the form of failure, rejection, abandonment, betrayal, unemployment, loneliness, depression, the loss of a loved one. When we are deaf to everything but the shriek of our own pain, when the world around us suddenly seems hostile in a menacing place, at those times we cry out in anguish. How could a loving God permit this to happen? At such moments, the seeds of distrust are sown. It requires heroic courage to trust the love of God no matter what happens to us. Wow. When I look around at the world today and everything crazy is going on, when you've got somebody in North Korea who has missiles that wants to blow up everybody else, when you've got a president of the America who used to be um, a, TV, a TV person, you know, you've got Trump over in America running things. I'm sorry for that, by the way, you know? <laughs> But when you have all of these things going on in the world today, we look up at God and we're like, what are you doing? What are you doing? This is, this is just chaos at the moment. And, and these seeds of distrust are sown. When we have depression that comes into our life, when we have loneliness, when we lose our jobs, all of these things that happen, immediately we look at God and say, I don't know, man. I don't know if this is what I signed up for, but we did. We did sign up for that. And you know the best thing about this though is that when you have unwavering trust, no matter what comes at you, we know that we have a God, just like Brennan Manning says, that is gonna show up. You know, we serve a God who has the ability to overwhelm the things that overwhelm us. Did you hear that? We have a God who can overwhelm the things that overwhelm us. We can trust God. And what I take away from this story today with Mary is her yes, because she said yes. And she said it in a way that trusted God with the rest of her life, knowing that what the, the path that she chose wasn't gonna be easy. It wasn't gonna be all roses and butterflies and unicorns. It was gonna be really hard. I'm challenged by stories that I come across with people I've either met or things that I've heard through Barnabas Fund because the Christians in these countries where they struggle, they have said yes to a hard life. They have said yes to persecution. Some of them have said yes to death. Right now, persecution is at an all-time high for the fourth year in a row. And to be quite honest with you, I'm getting tired of saying this because every year I say it's the highest it's ever been. And with things like ISIS and with groups like Boko Haram who are terrorizing Christians in Africa, you know, in Nigeria, they um, have had a church attack every week for like the past four years. Can you imagine? Every week there's an attack on a church. Every week Christians go to church going, wait, this might not be um, the day that, that I come back. This might be the day that I, that I go to be with Jesus. And then we've got the story of a young boy named Amos that we're gonna see here on this, on this screen in a second. And let me tell you about Amos because Amos is a, is a young boy. He's a, a South Sudanese boy. And I don't know if you know this right now, but there's been a civil war in South Sudan for quite a while now. And there's famine in South Sudan. And there's famine because of this fighting. It's, it's a human um, cause to the famine. And so people have been struggling. Now Christians... The, the people in South Sudan, many of them are Christians. And so what they're doing is they're getting out of South Sudan and they're fleeing to places like Uganda to find some kind of refuge, some kind of safety. And they're, they're at camps, at refugee camps. And Amos is a young boy who left with his parents 
And on the road, they got attacked. They got ambushed. And he, got, he lost his parents that day. And he's left alone in the bush because you can't go down the normal roads. You can't just travel down the roads because you'll get the likelihood of you getting attacked is even greater. And so Amos is stuck in the bush and he's hungry and he sees a group of people, another group of people coming past and he asks if he can go with them and they say yes. And they go on for a little bit longer and the next thing you know, another group ambushes them and again, he's left. And this time he's starving, can't even walk, he's so weak. And another group comes along and they end up taking Amos and carrying him on their shoulders for the next three days to get to this camp in Uganda. Now, this is the tragedy of what's going on in the world today because a lot of the kids who are crossing the borders into Uganda are now orphans. But you know what? When you talk to kids like Amos, and when you talk to some of these other kids, they have seen some hard stuff. But you ask them about Jesus, and man, their face lights up. Can you imagine going through something like that, that kind of trauma, and the trust that boys like Amos need to have, and they, that they do have? You know, another challenge for these kids is that they, if they get caught by some of the military, that they'll be forced to be child, um, uh, work with the military, have to kill people at a young age, you know, things like that. That's a real struggle for them. And so these kids that are orphans now in Uganda, they, they just, they've lost their parents. Some of them have no idea if they'll ever see them again. Some of them are actually dead because they've died of starvation or they've gotten killed. But these kids are going to Sunday school and they're hearing about Jesus under a tree, <laughs> under a tree. They choose to love Christ. They choose to love God. They choose to say yes. If anything gets you through the next few days of your life, it's looking at a face like this and knowing that this little boy, in the midst of the hardest thing he's probably ever gonna have to go through in his life, chooses to say yes. And then you've got this next story of a family in Egypt. Now in Egypt, around Easter time last year, churches were attacked by two suicide bombers. The guy in the middle was um, a security guard at one of the churches in Egypt. And that day he spotted this guy with a suicide vest on and he stopped him. And because of that, he actually lost his life, but he saved so many more. And his wife, now a widow, she's on TV one day, and she's on a secular TV station, and they're interviewing her about what had happened. And the, the interviewer says to her, what would you say to that group of people, to that suicide bomber, if you could see him today? And you know what she said? Here's the yes of somebody who has unwavering trust in Jesus Christ. Because she said, I would forgive him. I would forgive him. You know, my husband died. But I know, I know that he has no regrets about that. He told me before that he knew that if he had to, he would be a martyr for Jesus Christ. And, and I'm so proud of him. But this is so hard for us because now we don't have a dad, I don't have a husband, and I'm alone. But I would forgive, I would forgive that man. And I would forgive that group that did that. Now for 15 seconds, the interviewer just didn't know what to say. Can you imagine 15 seconds of silence on TV? It's like an eternity, right? And the next thing you know, he says to her, you Egyptian Christians are made of steel. Ah, that day, her yes, her forgiveness, her choice to trust God in the midst of losing her husband, it made a difference. It changed the lives of people in Egypt. It changed my life because there are times when I do not wanna forgive people. I mean, anybody else in my camp? Or are all of us just awesome Christians and we forgive everybody who does stuff to us? You know, we have this, this people are gonna do awful things to us. They're gonna hurt us. And it's easy for us to love and say yes to people who are nice to us, you know? We'll do anything for our friends and family because we love them and they're good to us and we know they do anything for us. But will we do anything for the worst of the worst ISIS member who kills your family, who beheads your dad, your mom, your kid. I get so angry with the world today and all the stories that I hear about how Christians are persecuted, but I trust God and I know that these Christians trust him. I know that they have unwavering trust just like Mary did. So my question to you today is this, what yes is God asking you to make? What yes is he asking you to say? 
How are we and how do we let God direct our lives or redirect our lives? Are we open to that? Do we have unwavering trust? Do we read the story of Mary and do we make our life a pattern after Mary's life, a life that chooses yes, no matter how hard it's gonna be? Maybe some of you in here today need to say yes to Jesus. I don't know. It's Christmas time. Maybe your mom dragged you to church that one time a year that you've gotta be here. No idea what's going on in your world today, but I can guarantee you that Jesus is asking you that question today. Are you gonna say the best yes ever? Are you gonna let me do something with your life that is illogical and crazy, but know at the same time that I have got you and that everything is gonna be okay? What is that yes? I'm gonna pray for us um, right now and I want you to think about that challenge. I want you to think about that question because I actually want you to answer that today. And I'm gonna invite the, the worship team to come back up as well. But let's just bow our heads and just, and just think about what that yes is for just a second. Heavenly Father, we are so, so grateful for this time of year. We are so grateful for the fact that your son Jesus came to this world vulnerable in a yucky manger and he lived a life of sacrifice because he knew the end result was us spending eternity with him. It was repairing a relationship. I mean, the ultimate best yes ever obviously is Jesus. But then we've got this yes that you're asking us to make as well. We've got this, this thing in our lives that you're asking us to say yes to, whether it's forgiving somebody who's hurt us, whether it's a job change, whatever it is, God, you're asking us to say yes to something. And the decision that we make today and the thing that we say yes to, I pray that you give us the courage to do that. Give us the unwavering trust that Mary had that day when she said, may it be as you said, when she said, bring it on. May we say that to you. God, use our lives to change other people's lives the way that Mary's life and her yes changed mine. Lord, I pray that you do something in us today that, that causes other people to have courage as well. Move through our lives. It doesn't have to be this massive thing. Sometimes our yes is a small yes, but it makes a big difference. So God, may we say yes to you today. May we say the best yes ever. In Jesus' name, amen.